Shalom, brothers and sisters. Today's Thursday thought is going to be on prayer, more specifically, how to pray with purpose and power. And I want to start that off by explaining my perception of prayer, and that is that prayer is an opportunity for us to engage personally with God and build that relationship that we have with God. So that said, in Mormon Kabbalah, the idea of prayer isn't the idea that we have a wish list. We can't just say, okay, well, I want X, Y, and Z, God, make it happen. It's not about changing our circumstances as much as it is changing our hearts, changing who we are, because the true prayer comes from our hearts and not just some words that we read or some things that we think or some wishes that we make. It's got to be deeply personal. So with that, I'm going to use the Lord's Prayer to share my thoughts, I guess as an outline to share my thoughts on how to pray with real purpose and power and, and how to make prayer more effective for you in your life. Now that prayer can be found in Matthew and Luke in the New Testament and 3rd Nephi in the Book of Mormon. And it starts off saying, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So there's two things here. Number one, it is showing a personal relationship. It's addressing God, our Creator, as a parent figure. So it, it's got to be a personal relationship that we have with God. And the second one is, hallowed be thy name. It's a respectful relationship. We understand that as a Creator and as God, God is all-powerful and a great, the greatest source, if not the only source of good, in the universe. All righteousness, all good things, all light comes from Him. Or them, if you believe in God the Father and God the Mother. So, the second line here, and, and this to me is really key. So, if we know that God, it's a personal relationship, we, we know that it's a sacred relationship. That, that this is a sacred opportunity that we have. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now that is key for me because we aren't seeking our will. We're seeking God's will. We're praying to know what God wants for us. Now if, if you know me and you're familiar with the ministry the Lord has called me to, then you'll know that I am not a huge fan of what's called the prosperity gospel. And the reason why is because the prosperity gospel teaches this idea that if you're poor then all you have to do is give money to you know a church or a pastor or whatever, and God will bless you with money. It's like some sort of magical formula. And there's also this idea in there that God rewards us with riches. And so therefore, if we have wealth, if we have a lot of worldly means, then God loves us more, and we're more righteous than those that are poor or, or don't have those kind of, of, of wealth, basically. Now, if you read the Bible or the Book of Mormon, you can see that that's a ridiculous idea. It's always talking about how we need to care for the poor. You know, the poor are going to inherit the earth, you know, these type of things. So, rather than trying to change God's mind on something, what we need to do is seek His will. And I will tell you, when you have a personal relationship with God, there are going to be times when His will is, I want to hear you argue this case. I want to hear you tell me why you think this thing should happen. Because he loves us and he wants to hear what we have to say. The thing is, and, and this is again key, it's not how we say it in the sense of what words we use. It's not even why we say it. In Mormon Kabbalah we teach that it's where we say it, where, where this prayer comes from. It has to come from the heart. You can mumble out whatever words, but at the end of the day, what God's really listening to is what's in your soul and how you're expressing your soul to Him. So when it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, our truest and purest desire is for God's will to be met. And so when we pray, we must keep this in mind. And so 
here's the thing. And, and this is why, in my mind, this is so important. Let's say you have five families. They're all good people. They all do their part. They, they, they love the Lord. And they're all telling God you know, there's a limited resource. There's something there that all five of them want, but only one family can have it. And all five of them are saying, Lord, give me this, this thing. Well, we'll say that it's a house. Lord, bless me with this house. So now what's happening is God is being asked to choose between these five families. How does God choose? Does God say, well, this family is the most righteous. This family has followed these, these you know, commandments or whatever. This family has, has not done a lot of commandments, but they've kept this one particular commandment so well, so much better than the others. I mean, how, how does God determine this? I, I don't think that God does. I think the way it actually works is all five families in righteousness say, Lord, we would like to have an opportunity to purchase or own this house. If it is your will, please make it so. We believe that it is your will. If we're wrong, please tell us what your will is so that we can know. I heard a really good talk one time when I was younger, and this brother was saying how he had two really good job opportunities. And he looked at them and he said, okay, well, I could move here and do this, or I could stay here and do this, and this one pays this, this one pays this. And he kind of had it in his mind which one he wanted to do. But then he went to the Lord in prayer, and the Lord told him, point blank, verbatim, you've already made up your mind, why are you asking me? Shouldn't we go to the Lord in the first place? And what if the Lord didn't want him to take either opportunity? So, in, in his message, he shared that he repented. He washed it clean and he started over. And he said, Lord, I need to know where you want me to go and what you want me to do. And if either of these opportunities are true opportunities, or if they're merely obstacles getting in the way of something else that you have for me. That's how we need to pray. We need to seek the Lord's will here on earth. Because as Christians, our duty isn't to get to heaven. It's to bring heaven down here to the earth. And we can do that in our prayers. And as we grow in grace, with our heart changing through the grace of Jesus Christ, that light pours out from us correcting the earth. Now, the next one says, give us this day our daily bread. You know, so we, we do want to ask that our needs be met. But it's not being greedy. It's not saying, give us this day meat, potatoes, riches. Give us what we need. Bread is a very humble food. And I say that because you have to, back then, you had to raise the, the grain. You had to crush it into flour. You had to get all the ingredients together. You had to bake it. It's not like today where you just go to the store and like, hey, here's a couple bucks, give me a loaf of bread. So we're asking for something that we're going to put some effort in ourselves to obtain. God is not a genie. Yes, miracles do happen. And if the Lord tells you to pray for a miracle, do it. At the same time, if the Lord tells you to pray that you'll have the strength to do the work that needs to be done to accomplish your goal, do that. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Notice how balanced that is. We're not asking for any more than what we've given. We want the Lord to forgive us not because we've forgiven others, but as we have forgiven others. Again, it's still in God's hands. God is the one who's going to offer the forgiveness. And we need that grace. That's what makes us worthy. The next line is rather interesting. 
Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, as Christians, we generally don't believe that God's the one that leads us into temptation. Maybe a better way to say that would be, let us not be led into temptation. But it very clearly says, lead us not into temptation. Excuse me, lead us not into temptation. This shows us that God is in control of all things. It puts all of the power in God's hands. When I was growing up, I remember all those the Tom and Jerry cartoons and other cartoons. They had the the angel on the one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder. But that's not really how things work because it gives this idea that there's a war. There's a balance that has to be maintained between good and evil. And, and there isn't. God is just all good. But even though God is all good, that, that doesn't mean that bad things aren't going to happen. And so when I read this idea of lead us on a temptation, into temptation, I feel like that for me means don't give us anything that we can't handle. Be there with us as we go through the trials of life. Because the reality is that, in my mind, the hardest trial you can have is to live a life of absolute comfort. Because you grow to expect everyone to cater to all of your needs. Our goal here, we didn't come here. Our goal here isn't and shouldn't be to better ourselves, our own lives, to be comfortable ourselves. I mean, yeah, we want to eat. We want to have a roof over our head. We want to live in somewhat relative comfort. But once our needs are met... The next step is to make sure that other people's needs are met to the best of our capacity. So where is that balance in your life? Well, if we are following the Lord's will, we won't be led into temptation. He'll help us find that balance and we'll remember that relationship. Our Father which art in heaven. And then in the end, it reminds us, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. This is all on you. It's not my will, it's yours. Because you are the creator. I'm a finite being, but you are the infinite God. I know there are people who read this prayer religiously. They read it. And it is, for some people, their prayer. And it's not a bad thing. Because this is the perfect prayer. It has all of the ingredients. If, if you want to see a prayer as a recipe, this is the recipe on how to make the soup or the dish that is called prayer. We don't have to necessarily follow in this order. But it has all the things that we need to figure out how to say from our hearts. My personal God, you are holy. I respect you. I want to know what your will is for me in my life. Grant me this wisdom. Grant me the strength that I need so that I know what it is that I need. Be fair and balanced with me. Help me as I help others. Forgive me as I forgive others. Bless me as I bless others. Help me to not be led astray. Deliver me from temptation, from evil. Because all of this is yours. This is your creation. You have all the power. You have all the glory. And I submit my will to yours. 
That's another way of saying that prayer. But again, the words don't matter. It's what's in here that matters. That's why when I pray, particularly in meetings, I like to say, please bless us that we will speak not merely mouth to ear, but spirit to spirit. And I mean that because that's the purest form of communication. When we can hear each other's hearts. That's how God hears us. It's how we truly hear one another. It's how we truly listen to one another. So if you truly want to speak to God, let what's coming from your mouth come from your heart and keep your mind and ears open. Listen to what God has to say. Don't preach at God. Don't speak at God. Don't talk at God. Have a conversation. Communicate with God openly in a vulnerable way. There's nothing God doesn't know. And sometimes prayer can be the way that you learn about yourself. Telling God what's in your heart can help you understand what's in your heart. So if you want to pray with a real purpose and real power, make sure it comes from here and make sure you're listening. And remember, not my will, but God's. Those are my thoughts on prayer today and I leave them with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.